Okay, well, today I'm joined by Christian Hacking from the Council for Bioethical Reform. Now, on YouTube, just recently, I saw a video by Christian where he was discussing pro-life issues, abortion issues in Scotland. It was really fascinating. And it was really encouraging that someone outside Scotland has taken the time to look at what's going on here. So, so welcome, Christian. It's great Thank to have you. you here today. Really looking forward to hearing what you've you've got to say. So you've been looking at this issue in Scotland. What have you found? Well, I have. So, I mean, uh, I mean, the Scot the Scots are very special. They're very special people. I, I'm I'm sad that you think so little of yourself that anyone would want to research things going on in in your part of the world. But uh, I mean, what, what triggered this was, so we're from the Centre for Bioethical Reform. We're an organisation that seeks to educate on the reality of um, the humanity of the unborn child and the reality of abortion. And so, you know, we keep a BDI on abortion statistics. And last, um, I think it was last week, um, the 2019 Scottish abortion statistics came out. Um, and so in my weekly news update, I decided to kind of focus on that. And I'm delighted, you know, um, Scottish people found it helpful. So, uh, <clears throat> um, but I mean, the statistics themselves uh, are probably worth looking at. Um, mm -hmm. So the 29 statistics show that there were 13,583 um unborn children killed by abortion in Scotland last year. That's actually the highest total you guys have had since 2008. It's an increase of 270, sorry, 297 um, from last year. Um, mm. It's worth noting that 52% of those will be women in the 20 to 30 category, 35% um, with those women in their 30s. And finally, um, you had a record number of abortions for uh, women in the plus 40 category, which is always a surprise, um, simply because, you know, women in their 40s should, um, as far as trajectory goes, be in a more stable place emotionally um, and financially and otherwise. So so some of those justifications, I mean, you certainly wouldn't get a 40 year old woman saying, you know, my, I needed to go, I needed to continue with my education. So, it's, so mm -hmm. it and um, when you've got abortions in the plus 40 category, it it, it is um, indicative of um, something quite deep culturally um, that people are choosing to go for an abortion when when potentially there could be provision around for them. Um, a small subset of those would be diagnoses of of kind of um, Down syndrome, which has a higher prevalence later on in life. Mm -hmm. um, but but that would be a small percentage simply because of all the abortions of the 13 and a half thousand that you had 211 were on children with disabilities so so we can assume that a number of those 40 most of those 40 year olds um there wasn't necessarily a diagnosis um 34 percent were repeat abortions that's figure slightly lower than in the uk mm -hmm. um or, or it's, um is it is it 30 it may be, i mean it's either it's either low or the same as in the uk and then also the great majority being medical um abortions so um abortions through the taking of um two sets of pills the first one effectively um kills the unborn child um or makes an environment in which that unborn child can't survive and the second one induces um what abortion providers refer to as you know a heavy um period although what mm -hmm. many women who take the pill describe as basically labor pains um and it expels the child um, from the mother. Um, the child is worth noting. So here, here's some amazing uh, images of human development um, of eight weeks, an eight week old embryo and a nine week old fetus. Um, these images were used with the same technology they used to kind of make. I don't know if you've ever seen an, um, a picture of the Earth um, from NASA, um, yeah. the kind of whole globe. So so what, what many people don't realize is that that wasn't one image um, because in order to get that, that resolution of the earth, you have to take a series of images which are stitched together. And so, so the two images um, here have, have, have used that same technology. So they are multiple images of a developing um, embryo and fetus from the moment of fertilization um, that have been stitched together to, to make these, you know, some of the most um, detailed images we have of, you know, human life in its earlier stages. Um, 
<clears throat> now most of these pregnancies most women don't know they're pregnant until six weeks so so we can we can assume that most of these children will be aborted in the um the six to eight week bra bracket um you know at which point you know their heart's beating um they've got brain waves at six weeks you know f hands fingers etc are moving um the the manual and um, for home abortion in the uk you know downplays the humanity of the unborn child it doesn't refer to it as a child at all it says it's kind of pregnancy tissue um, and says you're, you're very unlikely to see it at nine weeks um, the issue being that in Scotland the limit is actually 12 weeks um, in which your child is highly likely to to not only be seen but very distinguishable um, um, at which point it it recommends you know to either flush them down the toilet or um, to wrap them in a piece of tissue and dispose of them in a bin. The same fate we would tend to give a pet goldfish. Um, so so can you clarify the, the difference between Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK on that point? Um, at the start of lockdown, we had huge, the biggest changes to abortion measures since 1967, which was uh, without a vote in Parliament, um, they basically just suddenly decided to bring in um, what they call kind of telemed abortions, so abortions at home in which women can take both pills at home. Um, what what in effect is DIY home abortions? Um, and whereas the UK has set a so whereas um, England has and Wales have set a cap of ten weeks on home abortion, um, Scotland have have said that uh, women can receive these pills and take these pills up to twelve weeks gestation. Now that's in theory. Right um these women are not required um legally to come into a clinic so they so there's no um there's no um proof of gestational age through ultrasound as you would if you were um having an in in clinic abortion and so so basically all women really need to give is their name the address of a local gp practice um and mm -hmm. their their last menstrual period in order to get an abortion um and and the abortion provider has to assume that that last menstrual period is an accurate one um, unfortunately, we know already that, you know, for a cacophony of different reasons, uh, women are not giving their accurate um, last menstrual period and are delivering children at 18, 20. And there's even one, um, it's a murder investigation going on in the UK for a child born at plus 30 weeks who was still alive when um, they were born. Um, so, I mean, this is this uh, lunacy of the current um, DIY home abortion measures, mm -hmm. you know, bought in on the back of this you know the messaging you know stay at home protect the nhs save lives um mm -hmm. whereas actually the reality of these pills is um because the complication rate is fourfold higher for surgical abortion the, the for so many women they're going to get complications they're going to get infections they're going to need to go to hospital and even it's if it's a successful abortion procedure well you can hardly say it's saving lives um it's killing an unborn life and it's reaping trauma and uh, on the on the mother who's taking these pills. So, I mean, it, it's an it's a total farce um, to think that this was introduced as you know a a benevolent response to COVID, helping women in a crisis. Um, this was always the plan of the abortion industry to get abortions out of the clinics and into people's homes, and they've just used COVID to fast track that process. Um, and and unsuspecting and misinformed women are reaping the consequences um, as we speak. Was there much opposition to that? In, 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 no, so in part in Parliament, none at all. I mean, it wasn't even it wasn't even put up to vote. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was basically some some high calls made from the abortion industry to their lobbyists in Parliament who put pressure on uh, Matt Hancock, who who changed the legislation, not knowing, um, you know, not knowing any better. Um, and now, and you know, you've got w women presenting in a &E departments up and down the country. I, I heard one story from, um, I think it was um, Fife, um, uh, or the, I'm, I'll need to get the exact, yeah, so um, there we go, Fourth Valley Hospital. So in June, a woman presented at Fourth Valley Hospital, um, having obtained these pills at 11 weeks, and then she umdenard until her 19th week. So she took the pills in her 19th week and she delivered the baby at 20 weeks and and right. presented at um at that hospital you know with the signs of trauma you know totally unexpecting uh mm. what was happening to her so um so i mean we're talking about huge changes um 
that were informed by the abortion industry and their allies um, in regulation um, and not with due regard to the unborn child or to the to the people who are actually really going to be taking these pills. And, mm. and I mean, th their their response, you know, you know, th there was a um, uh, an organization in the UK called Christian Concern took the government's task over the introduction of DIY home abortions during that um, legal proceedings and a leaked email was given as evidence from mm. NHS improvements and NHS England. And it was sent to um, it was either sent from or to midwives, you know, detailing 13 serious incidences caused by DIY home abortion pills, including two maternal deaths, um, uh, resusc resuscitations, hemorrhages. Um, and as I've said, uh, women um, delivering babies long past the gestational cutoff. Um, and, and but what this is always followed with is a total kind of, you know, compared to the number of abortions we've done, which at the time was 16,000, this is a phenomenally small number. You know, let's not get caught up in those small cases, those tragic examples, you know, because because the whole thing is so um, needed and, you know, good uh, for for mothers. So so it's kind of the, the question really for policymakers is, you know, will they pay heed of the of the small voice um, and the, just the, the ever increasing number of mothers? Um, yeah. So that's two things. So, so Scotland's got a. So, are you going to ask a question? Go for it. Uh, I was just saying, would you anticipate that whenever this sort of coronavirus legislation uh, is rolled back, that there'll be an attempt to leave that as it is? Yeah, well, we're already seeing it. So, so from from the moment they brought in these DIY measures, you know, the abortion industry were 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 publishing, you know, stories in the papers of of women who who had took these pills had an incredibly smooth experience you know nothing yeah. like as bad as what they thought it was incredibly easy and um yeah. you know with the odd comment on the end why wouldn't we keep this on um and and so so the uk who um well when when the, these new measures were brought in they were brought in as a temporary measure not in the corona act they got bounced from that but kind of as a kind of you know department of health um change afterwards it was brought in as a temporary one and yet you know now um the uk government today announced that they're going to have a parliamentary review on this to see whether they're going to keep it permanent so so the the goalposts keep changing um yeah. but that this is very much it's always you know going you can look at sources from um that the abortion industry have produced you know going back 2017 before COVID, it has always been their desire to get abortion into people's homes because it gets it away from the clinic, it gets it as early as possible, and it doesn't mean you know that it, it prevents all the other complications of trying to find doctors to perform abortions at plus 12, 13 weeks, um, you know, of which very few really want to do because um, it's a horrendous procedure that you know involves kind of crushing a human being, and they know it. So, um, so th so this is kind of this. You know, it's it's been part of their practice forever, and yes, they are most certainly going to push for it to be a permanent fixture moving forward. Um, right. Okay. Um, well, the, the the third thing I was going to um, talk about. So, so I mean, the pills by post inevitably, and I, I do want um, you know to show your viewers a, a graphic image right now. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a, a a depiction of of what you know women up and down the country will see see having taken that second set of pills at you know eight weeks you know nine ten eleven weeks you know they will they'll be confronted with um a very little dead um baby uh, and that baby in the majority of cases will then be flushed down the toilet um mm. and join our sewage system so 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 as a society you know we live in this peculiar time where you know there's government campaigns to prevent us from flushing wet wipes down the toilet because they are not biodegradable but, mm -hmm. but your own children well that's another story um uh -huh. and with these, and with these new legislation it raises this whole conundrum of well where can this happen you know you know what if a woman takes the pills and you know it's on a long train journey you know you know in a train toilet or or what if a woman gets called into work last minute um and mm. And then ends up aborting in her home toilet, in her work toilet. I mean, it's 
we, there's no end to where this can go and and it's defiling of us as a society if if we're to treat human beings like feces um and to give them the same fate um so i mean aside from the it's interesting today i mean nicola sturgeon was having like a twitter exchange with hamza yusuf the justice secretary and they're both talking about experiences of miscarriages mm. they're talking about it very sensitively and seriously mm. but completely failing to to just follow follow the logic that what they're doing is is sort of deliberately ending the life of unborn children on a sort of industrial scale mm. they don't mm. have any qualms about that at all and yet when it mm. comes down to their individual circumstances they can see the true impact of it that they mm. can understand it then i mean mm. how, how people can not connect those things together i don't know it's it's well, it, I, it's, it's, it's i mean it's it's cultural schizophrenia you know uh -huh. either a child is a human being and matters uh -huh. at which point it's it's a sad loss whenever they die uh -huh. or it's a clump of cells it's a product of um conception and it has no value and and you know we should we should tell all the women struggling with a miscarriage to you know buck up and you know get over it yeah but of course we but, we don't yeah. We don't because there's something we, we've we've come to believe that that as as mothers and as a society, we can ascribe value depending on how wanted something is. Yeah. Um, it's found on emotion, isn't it? They think that the like the tragedy of a miscarriage is that the couple were really looking forward to having a baby and they really wanted one. So they're really disappointed and upset. Mm, and that, that's mm. really the significant thing rather than anything objective about mm. it. Uh, and that's uh, I've talked about this before in Scottish politics. So much of it is founded on, on sort of empathising and emotion, rather mm. than actually any sort of rational assessment, objective mm. assessment of the issues involved. I mean, mm. this is a classic case. So, I mean, I would imagine it could be foreseeable in the future if we were to use some some images in campaigning, such as you you've shown. I could well imagine that some, like you said, people would object that it was un insensitive. On the grounds they've had a miscarriage or whatever mm. but if politicians who are pushing abortion and promoting abortion vigorously also then object on the grounds that they've had a miscarriage well i think that, that was sort of a very interesting conversation mm. well i mean and that's that's exactly why these images have been developed because mm -hmm. because we are dealing with a society that is post fact and all feeling and so Mm -hmm. So in any strategy to educate on abortion, you have to be savvy to this. You have to be savvy to this reality and you you have to confront people with facts that also hit feelings. Mm -hmm. um, because because unless people are confronted with both, then it, it, it won't make sense to the kind of the current political lens in which we mm -hmm. seem to kind of work. So, yeah, you're quite right. You know, in, in America, where these um, images have been far better tried and tested, you know, they've they've put um politicians next to the reality of abortion in swing states and they've seen last minute swings in in voting patterns you know because people are just thinking hang on <laughs> you know, yeah. you know uh, and, yeah. and uh, you know forcing um politicians to not only justify their own policies you know and abortion when it's couched in euphemisms looks very palatable in black and white you know um, but when the euphemisms are stripped out, especially through use of imagery, you know, there's nothing just you can't justify it. It's, it's morally unjustifiable. Um, yeah. And it's very important that politicians should be made to to answer to that. Um, yeah. But uh, at the moment we've got so the Greens <laughs> and the Lib Dems, their policy is decri full decriminalization of abortion. So that's abortion up to full term. I mean, Labour, that's now the Labour policy as well, isn't it? It was the last election. Yeah. Uh, UK wide. And that the SNP government pay quite a few organisations who campaign for abortion up to full term, feminist mm. organisations uh, like Scottish Women Aid, Women's Aid, etc. And that's seen as a perfectly respectable point of view. To put well, forward. I imagine that the, the people who promote that point of view, they don't have the slightest fear that this might backfire on them in some way or might embarrass them. Well, but, no, but, also, all, but also decrim is a euphemism right mm -hmm. so so the whole decrim campaign is basically sold as we've got these victorian laws that could mm -hmm. potentially although they're never really used send poor mothers who have accessed abortion to jail 
for doing something that in the rest of the UK is safe and legal, right? Yeah. Decrim has never been about um, these mothers accessing abortion. It's always been about the interests of the abortion industry to operate without the kind of severe scrutiny of criminal law. The abortion mm -hmm. industry are desperate to get themselves out of criminal law and to put themselves into some medical framework in which the scope of their um, provision will be far wider. And, you know, if they make a mishap, well, no one's going to go to jail because the worst we're going to get is a £5,000 fine. That's exactly what's happened mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. We, we mustn't, our voters mustn't be deceived that this, you know, this is not about the, the, the best interests of mothers. This is an ideological charged campaign to ensure that the borders of abor the abortion industry are safe um, from legal scrutiny. And, and, and because I think the clock is ticking against them, because I think the truth is slowly coming out, mm -hmm. I think they're desperately trying to push this um, to get this into law or to get themselves out of criminal law as soon as possible because they, they know their time is nigh. Um, and they're looking over to the states where you know huge exposure work has happened on the abortion industry, and mm -hmm. and they and the abortion industry has, has come under huge amounts of pressure, and rightfully so because of the harm it's causing. Um, yeah. So we so so I mean this the decrim stuff will really bite politicians when when politicians are made to, when they when it's revealed and made entirely clear that this is not about decrim. I mean I mean take for example the recent vote in the UK. It was on a domestic abuse. Um, vote that the abortion industry tried to bring in measures to decriminalize abortion. Okay. And politicians mm -hmm. were rightly smelling a fish because they were saying, surely if someone is in an abusive situation, they need more professionals, social workers, GPs into that equation. And, and what you're suggesting right now is we should actually have less people and just a telemed consultation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and lo and behold, um, uh, Diana Johnson withdrew the amendment before it even got to vote, you know, mm -hmm. presumably because she realized they were going to lose and they were going to lose bad. But it just goes to show, you know, how much do they really care for women if they're trying to, you know, if they're trying to bring in less safeguards and less support in a, in a, in a um, domestic abuse bill. Um, so, so yes, I mean, all of this is going to backfire. Um, at some point, the questions when, and because the other thing that many mainline political parties in Scotland and the UK have also signed up for is arbitrary, you know, buffer zones around clinics, um, mm -hmm. which again, it, it, you know, is a total affront, you know, not only to libertarian thought, um, but also plays, you know, again, it, you know, it's not okay. They say to harass women trying to access safe and legal. Um, healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. But what if the reality is, you know, they don't like people raising gently or prayerfully a conscientious objection to what they're doing? Because, mm -hmm. because when people are outside clinics, that affects business, you know, to use a very blunt metaphor, it hardens the yeah. meat before slaughter, it conflicts um, patients visiting the clinic, you know, that maybe what they're doing is not a, the right thing. And, and so, so clinics are kind of having to deal with disgruntled, upset, you know, um, conscious, you know, uh, conscientiously muddled people, which, which isn't what they want. So they've, so they've created a campaign that is meant to be mm -hmm. woman focused. It's actually industrial focused, you know, and, and everyone's bought it. Um, and yeah. so the, so the reworking yeah. of this is, is to help, people see what's going on. It's to get truth to the very bottom um, and to take the focus off um, where they want it to be and put the focus exactly where it needs to be, which is what is abortion and what is it doing to unborn children yeah. and to those who take those pills. You're saying about the sort of abortion industry being a, a force uh, behind a lot of this. I mean, in Scotland, it appears to me as if a huge amount, of, certainly publicly, a lot of the push in the direction of liberalisation of abortion, promotion of abortion, is from feminist organisations. I mean, for example, the Scottish government funds an organisation called Close the Gap. They're trying, you know, closing the gender pay gap. Mm. A part of their rationale as well, you know, if women are going to have these uh, their careers unhindered and going to earn as much as men, then, they, you know, we need to decriminalise abortion to make sure that they can get on with their careers, no, ma no matter what point they change their mind during a pregnancy. Mm. And that's the sort of line you hear coming through. I think in Scotland, there are much more of these government funded bodies and, and they're very powerful. And I would say they're 
it, it appears to me in any case that they seem to be the main driving force behind the push for abortion liberalization yeah mm. that's maybe not there's maybe not so much of that in england well i mean yeah, but you you mustn't you know of course um the the the, the lobbying players are going to be different in in different mm. regions but but ultimately the when you've got a service up and running you know be it in scotland with sandyford or brook or wh whoever's providing your provision mm. at some point you know they're going to be um prescribing these pills and and your health service is going to be um being sent a bill mm. you know and 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 if it's a surgical abortion if it's a later abortion they get more money um mm. and so you know whilst people you know uh, so much of this stuff you know they're non-for-profit and there's charitable sectors and there's kind of you know community pressure groups but yeah at the end of the day i mean this is a paid service and and these um these services are not willing to help these mothers out with child care they're not willing to um hold their hand through the emotional turmoil of the next you know decade or 20 years that they're, they're not mm -hmm. willing to help them out with their rent or or mm -hmm. or really you know put in the measures to ensure that you know if they're in an abusive situation they are removed immediately you know mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a short-term short-sighted fix um you know yeah. that that seems to make sense but but really it's you know long term it's not in the best interest of anyone and 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 i think exposing you know uh where our money's going and and showing people the the streams or the financial streams in in abortion is vital for people to understand you know um yeah. bottom lines but but i mean i, yeah, I yeah. although i have done a bit of research i mean i we i, I haven't bottomed out the scottish system mm -hmm. or, um and the, the spot scottish abortion industry at all so so i, I hope somebody and um, watching this could could maybe fill me in or, or go away and and do a kind of phd in it and send me their paper because because it, it, it all needs to be exposed yeah yeah right over to someone let us know over to someone please yeah, yeah. Um, but but i think one of the one of the things i really wanted to draw out <clears throat> in this interview um <clears throat> it's just the roots of abortion so so that there's a slide um that i've produced and, and it's a quote from mary stopes um who was a a, a, a british um scientist and eugenicist um who who went on to found what is was mary stopes in the uk and also mary stopes international which provide a huge number of um abortions medical and otherwise Mm -hmm. um around the world um but it's it's fundamental for people to understand you know the roots of um the abortion industry in, in order to understand how to fight it so so mm -hmm. in her book from the 1920s radiant motherhood she states um a second and almost greater danger is not simple ignorance but the inborn incapacity which lies in the vast and ever-increasing stock of degenerates feeble-minded and unbalanced who are now in the midst and who devastate social customs these populate most rapidly these sorry these populate most rapidly these tend these tend proportionately to increase and these like the parasite upon a healthy tree sapping its vitality now sorry i haven't quoted that totally um uh, perfectly there but 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 really the the roots of abortion for mary stokes was, was eugenics it was mm -hmm. it was a means to stop the parasitical poor from getting too big um and and although um the language um has has changed in the way ab abortion providers ab um describe their procedures and and although the responsibility has shifted from a kind of you know we're doing this to you women as opposed to w women kind of t what what they claim is taking responsibility for their own bodies this this same stuff is still going on um and i want to argue in a moment that it's going on most prevalently um, and it's easiest to prove that this stuff is going on in Scotland. So when it comes to language, you know, we see so many words being kind of euphemized um, in order to achieve this. So, so killing a baby has become ending a pregnancy. The baby is regarded as a fetus, pregnancy tissue, clump of cells, the exploiting of a body, which is how Alice Poole, one of the early feminists, describes abortion, is now 
um, referred to as taking control of one's own body. Um, mm. Abortion, which is a very painful procedure, is described by abortion providers as treatment. Um, abortion, which I, I want to argue in a moment, is disempowering communities, um, is actually sold as empowering individuals. And men as mentioned mm. earlier, you know, saving lives outside of clinics. So trying to persuade you know, women to keep their babies outside of clinics as, is seen as harassing women attempting to access, you know, safe legal healthcare. So, so there's this constant reframing in language that has occurred um, in the last kind of 50 years, you know, yeah. constantly concealing the full truth. But the, but the real point I want to come on to is, you know, abortion is being used as a um, social, nearing, social engineering exercise to, to basically limit the number of poor and complex um, people in your community. So um, if you look at the Scottish abortion stats from 2019 and you scroll down to, um, you know, scroll down to figure six, termination rates in Scotland by deprivation area 2010 to 2019. Surprise, surprise, abortion um, happens most of all in the most deprived areas. Right. Mm. So so in the so it's it's about nine people per a thousand um, in in wealthy areas. It doubles to 16 or up to 18 people um, per a thousand in the most deprived areas. Yeah. Um, and and more so in recent years, Scotland have been trialing NHS Lothian. And, and this is also in a slide. Um, I've got the original fact sheet for that. NHS Lovium have been pursuing what's called um, um, ultra early medical abortions. So, so it's a, an abortion before the yolk sac has been formed. So the idea here is, you know, you, you, all you need is a pregnancy test that's positive and then we'll provide you with the abortion medication. So it's, you know, getting the idea is getting rid of the problem before it has even started. Mm. Um, but it, it, it not only shows a total disregard for life, but it also means you know, some of these women are going to be taking these very potent pills with high levels of side effects um, and complications, potentially not even having a baby um, inside them. And again, it, it just shows a it shows a, the prioritizing of population over the prioritizing of the person that is in front of you. I mean, why would you you would never want anyone to take these pills? I mean, I wouldn't want anyone to take these pills under any circumstance. But even if you're a conscientious pro-choice scientist, you know, you shouldn't want people to take these pills unless you are absolutely certain, you know, that there was a need to take them. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if they're working, you're feeling sick and you're vomiting and you're in excruciating pain and you can go on to bleed for three weeks afterwards, although many women report more. And, and this is the point I really want to make, that the science um, on abortion, much denied by the abortion industry, um, is it makes for very compelling and dire reading. OK, so. So um, the science from, uh, to quote a few studies, um, um, from Coleman in 2011 and Ferguson in 2013, I can give you the links to these studies if you want to include them in the video description, shows that anxiety increases um, between 28% and 60% for, from people who've had abortion. Depression increases by 53%. Self-harm can increase from 69 to 396%. Substance abuse, increases from 291 to 644% from one abortion. Alcoholism um, also increases from 134% to 149%. There's even one study that suggests that women are six times more likely to die the year after they've had one abortion, right? That's either by suicide, road traffic accident, health condition, or an abusive relationship that mm -hmm. has got worse through them deciding to abort that child. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, this is stuff, if you read the abortion literature that you get with these DIY abortion pills, they probably go as far to say is you will feel a mixture of emotions after taking these pills. But what you've got here is you've got pills that are being used to try to, you know, help poverty that are just compounding and worsening the situation and yeah. just making it even harder for people to climb out um, of poverty. And, and I, I'm fearful, you know, that that actually this stuff is being trialed um, in some of the most deprived communities in Scotland, um, and and far from empowering people, is is actually disempowering them. So th this is unique to Scotland. Well, I this, um... my, theory, my theory here is, I mean, I, I've sat in a number of abortion conferences, um, and I get the distinct impression that 
I think the I think the ultra early um, uh, early medical abortions. I think that's was trialed solely in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, I get the impression that some of this, when it comes to early medical abortion, you know, the Scottish regime is more, you know, liberal. Um, mm -hmm. I think because you know deprivation in Scotland at pl in places is incredibly high. So so I think you know Scottish policymakers wittingly or unwittingly have have said yes to far more than they realize and of course if they're being told that you know this is just like a heavy period that there's no long-term um mm -hmm. health consequences to this you know just a, a you know a period of mixed feeling you know mm -hmm. why wouldn't they with the evidence they're being provided but what's coming through is if you do deeper study and wider study especially from countries that don't benefit wouldn't benefit from you know criticizing abortion you know you you start to see a very different picture I mean, yeah. one of the disputed topics is abortion and breast cancer. You know, mm -hmm. abortion providers will jump upon you to say that, you know, there is absolutely no link. That's what their their paperwork says. But but there's a study, which I hope you will include in this. It's in one of the slides from 2020, right? It reviewed 76 studies from around the world. Okay, so, so you know, Chinese countries, Asian countries, you know, um, Finland and other places, totally around the world, right? 76 studies it assessed, 61 out of 76 showed a positive correlation between abortion and breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. so, so not only do we have, you know, potent drugs, killing children, traumatizing the poor, not only do we have, you know, all the knock-on consequences of, you know, um, mental health issues, substance abuse um, afterwards, not only do we have an increased risk of women dying, which, which presumably may leave um, mourning partners or children without parents. But then you've got, if you survive all of that, there's, there may be an increased chance that, you know, you're going to be filling up, you know, the cancer clinics um, because of early onset breast cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, as I said, this is totally short sighted, you know, long term, um, you know, we're doing a huge amount of damage here. And yet, you know, in the UK, and I don't think this is a coincidence, women don't have to give their NHS number before they access abortion, which mm -hmm. means, hey, we don't have any longitudinal data on this. You know, uh, the, the first, the, the most um, winnable legal battle or political battle for any political party, party fighting abortion is just to say, let's get NHS numbers attached to every abortion procedure, just so just so we can prove some things or disprove some things. Surely, I mean, that, well, that well, would be the in Scotland, there's so many areas in Scotland where the research and statistics that we would like to have to see the effect of, you know, different family setups or whatever, lots of things. In Scotland, just the, the research doesn't exist. Probably because then the universities, the, the, just the whole, just everything in Scotland, we call it the blob. There's just group think everywhere. And for a lot of these sorts of research, it needs someone with the motivation to think, right, this is something I'm going to find out about. As soon as the group thing gets too extensive, no one bothers to find out about the things that would be inconvenient truths. Mm. But what happened in Scotland that the data that we would really like doesn't exist. So we happen to say, look, these are countries where people have actually made the efforts to research these mm. things. And these are the consequences. And we assume it would be the same in Scotland if anyone bothers to actually look into it. Well, I, I think, well, I think, I think you're totally right. I, you know, there should be, unless you've got an ideological presupposition to something, there should be no reason why you wouldn't expose whatever you're doing to, you know, mm. impartial scientific analysis over a decade or 20 years. And and that, and that I think the fact that that doesn't happen is telling of where people's priorities are really at. I, I don't think this is data driven. I think this is ideologically driven. I think this mm. is, you know, this is the the horrendous consequence of the sexual revolution in the 60s and you know it's a bloody mopping up of what's going on and hey we don't want to put stats on it because freedom is the best right you know yeah and, and i think it, within, the, within the scottish parliament even when there is you know a range of data that there's other material to bring in generally the msps their diet is just being fed by these campaigning groups mainly government funded campaigning groups so they live in the bubble where all they get is just the drip feed of in this case you know pro-abortion material but there's the same in other topics as well so unless they're really unless they're very independently minded and they take the initiative to 
uh, independently, find other sources of information. They just sort of swim in this soup of mm. this liberal progressive uh, it's, it's a parallel universe. And yeah. the longer they spend in it, the more soaked in it they become and the less able they are to see other opinions. Yeah. Well, I... Compared to the Scottish Parliament, the Westminster Parliament is uh, is full of diversity of thought and original, uh, you know, original viewpoints. Well, I think I think that's generous. I think that's generous. But uh, well, but uh, I think you <clears throat> I think there are a few people in there. But I, I think you know we you know when you look at the when you cross analyze you know um, the, these groups and who's leading them and who's in charge of them you know there's a kind of ancestral nature to a lot of it, especially on particular issues like abortion. And it needs to be expanded. You need to bring in, it needs, you know, it needs huge overhaul. And, um, and I think, but the question is, you know, how do you create that deep desire and motivation to even bring about that change? And, and this brings me back to, you know, what, what we think to be central to, um, you know, campaigning and educating on abortion, you know, is basically to expose, to expose, to expose, to show people mm -hmm. where that liberal soup is going, who is yeah. suffering most as a result to that liberal soup. And may, 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 you know, these, you know, facts that hit your feelings and your emotions help to kind of give you that strong coffee you need, you know, to kind of um, wake up from it all. And so, yeah. so that's why, you know, the solution um, is for for me is you know not only to understand what's going on, not only to use correct language, but to expose, expose, expose. So to expose the humanity of the unborn child, you know, to visit our website CBR UK to see what the reality of abortion looks like, you know, and and also to uh, expose the players, you know, pushing this, you know, and and you know you know you know a great deal more than me, Richard, about you know these groups and and how they're operating. You know, it's to really you know name them, call them out, help people to see. Um, who's responsible, who's pushing them, what degrees they're studying, you know, um, hold their names and their facts against science. See, you know, see how it all aligns. It's that kind of, that stuff in the UK that, you know, it's not British, you know, that kind of, you know, I'm, you know, the world has suffered too much from investigative reports that end up removing the names at the last minute. You know, if you uh -huh. care more about the victim than you do about the people in power, then you don't mind keeping the names in because because what matters is directing uh, people to, you know, the problem and so the problem can be solved. And so, um, um, so yeah, that, that would be mine. Expose the humanity, expose the reality and expose the players. Um, yeah. And also, you know, one of my huge takeaways for you guys is, you know, make this a primary voting issue. You know, don't, you know, there's a, there's a, you have to believe that there's enough people out there deeply wounded by abortion, not just not just the mothers, the fathers, too. People who 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 wanted to have a baby, um, but their local health provider, you know, thought they were a bit dysfunctional. So they, you know, they strongly encourage their partner to have an abortion. They're wounding. They're hurting for somebody to stand up and say, you know what? You guys have been sold an absolute lie um, that has reaped untold you know, trauma on you guys for decades you know we as a party are not going to stand for it we may be a small voice but we're going to really we're going to really make a case on your behalf because we believe um we, we believe this is hurting you we believe that this is holding you back um from your potential you know i, I think that's essential to you know um seeing change um yeah, they're, they're good lines the opposition to abortion in scotland runs at about sort of 10 10 or 15 percent of the population which is more than enough. I and mean, if all those people voted for the Scottish Family Party, then we'd get MSPs into the Scottish Parliament. So for us as a small party, that's the, so for a big party, if you say running the Conservatives, you, you, it doesn't make any sort of electoral sense to try and appeal to 15%. Because for them, it's not going to increase their vote. They'd be doing the right thing, but it's not going to increase their vote. So even if they did believe that, even if they were pro-life, their strategist would say, look, we need to we need to back off this. But it's only going to change on the grand scale when, when public opinion shifts, isn't Absolutely. it? That's going, be, that's going to be the ultimate target. Yeah. But the question is, how is how's that going to happen? It's, it's not going to happen by having sort of a few po politicians who, you know, every now and again when a vote comes up, 
vote the right way. That, that, that's just, you know, that's just yeah. a number. But what yeah, we, if, if you look at, I mean, I people talk about William Wilberforce being the example of someone who, you know, worked from the inside in a mainstream party and got something changed. But if you look at what he did, he didn't just sit there in the parliament and just whenever a slavery vote happened to come up, he just voted the right way. He was absolutely at the forefront of campaigning. It was his dominant issue, and he pushed that at every possible opportunity. Now, if, if someone, if a modern politician was like that on, on pro-life issues, basically they wouldn't survive in any of the mainstream parties. They wouldn't have them. They wouldn't get through the selection procedure. Or, or if they did get through and they tried to be that sort of prominent, like single issue campaigner, pro-life, the parties wouldn't put up with it. Whereas in Scotland, smaller parties have got a chance. So I think if we could just put it on the agenda and start the debate, once the debate happens, I mean, the, the pro-life case is so, as you've been laid out, it's so clear and logical and powerful that if mm. people hear it, people will be won over to it. Um, so right. it's just like, I quite agree. I quite agree. The context people can hear it is through the political system. So if we had you know, pro-life MSPs in the Scottish Parliament, their importance isn't, you know, the next vote on abortion. There'd be, you know, a few more votes against it. The important thing would be they would be putting it on the agenda and there'd be people taking the initiative with it. So it'd be shifting public debate, opening up media debate. And, and that's all we need. We just need people to listen. I think convincing them is the easy bit. It's getting the audience and getting the platform to communicate. And if you've got people elected with that mission, then I think that's a big step forward. In that regard well if i could add one advance to it you, you uh -huh. mentioned you mentioned william wilberforce um i entirely agree with what you say you know you can't change public policy until you change public opinion um but wilberforce had a counterpart outside of parliament the the lesser known thomas clarkson yeah you know and this man was a uh, cambridge grad um who used to go up and down the country collecting information on slavery he would gather together the names of all the, you know, um, British sailors who died as part of the slave trade. Mm. He would he mm. would come around with the the shackles and the thumb screws used to um, suppress slaves on the ships. You know, yeah. he would have etchings of Brooks. He, he vividly made a case um, to the brutality of slavery. He took that which mm. was hidden and he he took it and he blew it up all around the UK. And then you've got Equiano, you know, publishing his testimony of which Thomas Clarkson was you know, hugely responsible. But what you had is a is a is a wonderful partnership between um, those who were contesting in the public square, um, mm. and then um, a man who could represent them politically. And mm. when those two come together, so you mentioned earlier, you know, you know, you, we have to work within the political system. It's a half truth. You you need you need people to be really pushing this in the public. You know, you know, almost as a non or cross political issue. And then yeah. you have people on the inside who are who are willing to. To take it further to willing to get the names and the stories you know you know and and you know and sharon you know in the estate who 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 took these pills during lockdown and it it got really nasty and it got really complicated well let's get sharon in to speak mm -hmm. to you know um our inquiry and it is it's that kind of partnership that is so needed yeah. to bring about change um yeah. what's really remarkable not many people know this is um Although the legislative battle to end the slave trade took about 40 years, public opinion on slavery shifted in about a four year period in the um, 1780s. Um, and, that, and that's because enough information was out in the public domain. You had wonderful, you know, activists, mainly females in the Bristol area, you know, lampooning everyone who took sugar in their tea, you mm -hmm. know, and it became such an issue that people suddenly had enough, you know, and and then and then the fight became you know how to eradicate you know this systematic racism mm -hmm. and injustice you know from that the English had established but but it's that you know it's the it's the changing of public opinion where where the battle is won and lost and mm -hmm. so so you know my my strong encouragement to to you would be you know before you get in you know keep educating on this in the public domain you know let come visit our website subscribe with us we can connect you with other people in your area who want to do the same thing because we've got a database on that um and and secondly when you do get into parliament you know as you um, vividly put earlier richard don't start don't subsume to that leftist 
you know, that blob, you know, but actually keep yourself rooted to the people on the outside, gathering the facts, making the case, because because really in that partnership comes all the change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's an argument waiting to be won. Mm. And we say it well. I think that's, uh, that's definitely the case. Right, have you got any other areas you wanted to touch on or have you? Um, no, um, yeah, I mean, you've, you've got the slide. So, so I guess insert them at will. Um, yep, do that. Uh, the, um, we, we're not a Christian organization. Um, uh, although, um, many of us in our organization are Christian. Um, and we strongly believe that, um, prayer is essential to seeing any, you know, significant change in any place be it in your own heart or marriage even um and so you know my uh my encouragement to you as an individual especially if you're struck by this is is for your activism to start from that place you know of humbly um acknowledging what's been going on um in our world you know before a god that deeply cares um so that would be my final point uh to you um but thank you so much for listening it's been a real pleasure no, uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate what you've brought. There's a lot of a uh, lot of new ideas there, and I'm sure people will find that very helpful. So, till next time, keep up your good work, and who knows, maybe we'll we'll see you again in a maybe you know maybe the conference in the future, or or maybe oh, on you let me know, Richard. You let me know if if you want to be at Wilberforce. I'm happy to be your Clarkson. Right. Thanks, Richard. Bless Bye. you. Bye. -bye.